All right, thank you everyone for joining today. My name is Melina Rice and I'm a fifth year PhD student and NSF graduate research fellow at Yale University. And today I'll be sharing with you some work that I've been doing in the stellar obliquities and long period exoplanet systems survey or SOLS um, using the high res instrument on Keck. So I'll start off with some background and motivation for the survey and why this is something interesting to look at. And then I'll discuss our first couple of results afterwards. Um, so to begin at the start, I want to begin with what exactly stellar obliquities are and why they're interesting to study. So the stellar obliquity is the angle between the stellar spin axis and the net angular momentum vector of the system. So by definition, a system is aligned if this obliquity value is zero. And when I say it's aligned, that means that the planet orbits around the equator of the star. Um, so this is kind of the simplest scenario that we might expect to see in a lot of different planetary systems because protoplanetary disks generally form around the equator of the host star. Um, that's what determines the spin of the entire system. Um, and generally we would expect that uh, all without extra dynamical interactions, most of these systems should generally be aligned. Uh, but that isn't necessarily the case in all these extrasolar systems that have been observed, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But for reference, the solar system is pretty close to alignment. It's misaligned to about six degrees when you're considering all of the planets. So it's not perfectly aligned, but it's pretty close to alignment. Um, it looks like everything just formed in a disk and there wasn't really a very strong dynamical interaction that led to a larger misalignment. Um, but there are a lot of processes that can produce these really large misalignments. There are a few examples of those shown here. So for example, you can have stellar flybys that can misalign either your protoplanetary disk um, and then afterwards the planets would form in the misaligned disk or they can also misalign planets um, after the disk has dispersed. You can also get uh, misalignments from planet-planet interactions or interactions with a binary star companion. So for example, you might have planet-planet scattering, or you might have something like three-body Kozai leadoff interactions that lead to these very large misalignments where the planet's no longer orbiting around the equator of the star. It gets sort of tilted, and the entire system is tilted relative to the star's spin. Um, so by measuring stellar obliquities, we can better understand how common different types of dynamical processes are in the evolutionary histories of different kinds of extrasolar systems. And that can give us important clues to understand how different types of planets form effectively. So to measure these obliquities, we make use of something called the Rossiter-McLaughlin effect. So since the star is rotating, the light that we receive from one side of the star is a little bit more blue shifted, and the light that we receive from the other side of the star is a little bit more red shifted. So that's the side moving towards you is blue shifted, side moving away is red shifted. And when a transiting planet passes over the disk of that star, then it blocks first one side of the star. So if it's aligned, it'll first block the blue shifted side, and then it'll pass over and block the red shifted side. And that produces a characteristic shift in the measured radial velocities that are measured, which is something that we measure with the high res instrument. Um, so this is just kind of a couple of examples of the types of signals that you would get for either an aligned or a misaligned system. So in an aligned system on the left here, you get a nice symmetric signal where the planet first passes over the blue shifted and then the red shifted part of the star. Um, and the amplitude of that signal that you get depends on the transit depth. So how big the planet is relative to the star, um, the projected stellar rotational velocity and the impact parameter, so just whether the planet is passing over the equator versus somewhere closer to the poles. You can also get misaligned systems, which then have these asymmetric profiles, um, and you can forward model to figure out, once you have these radial velocity measurements, what the alignment is um, based on what you get from the Rossiter-McLaughlin effect as you take these measurements across the transit of the planet. So again, we're taking radial velocity measurements as the planet is passing over the disk of its star. And the sky projected obliquities of many hot Jupiters have been measured using the Rossiter-McLaughlin effect, where hot Jupiters are giant planets that orbit very close into their host stars. And so even though hot Jupiters are intrinsically relatively rare, they have very deep and very frequent transits across which this effect can be measured. Um, so you can get relatively high signal to noise constraints on what those obliquities are. And an, a well-established trend that has come out of those measurements is that hot Jupiter's orbiting cool stars, which are the blue points here, tend to be relatively close to alignment. So they tend to orbit roughly around the star's equator, um, whereas hot Jupiter's around hot stars, which are the red points here, cover a wide range of possible spin orbit angles. 
So a 90 degree projected obliquity is a polar orbit. So that's like the orbit is sideways. Um, and a 180 degree obliquity would be a planet that's actually orbiting backwards relative to its star spin. So you get that whole range for hot stars. Um, whereas for cool stars, it's sort of this much more limited range of obliquities that have been measured. And the transition point between these two populations coincides with the craft break, which is a rotational discontinuity where stars transition from having convective envelopes below the craft break to having radiative envelopes above the craft break. So because the structure of your star is different, you get different tidal effects um, as well as different magnetic fields that occur around each of these stars where below the craft break, you have stronger magnetic fields, much stronger tides. And above the craft break, you have weaker magnetic fields and weaker tides as well. Um, so one of the ideas for sort of how this might or why we see this difference between the hot and the cool star populations is that um, around the cool stars, the stars themselves would actually be able to realign all of these planets if they were initially misaligned, whereas you can't do that for stars that are above the craft break. Um, so the observation that hot Jupiters at least around hot stars, tend to be commonly misaligned, is probably telling us something pretty important about how those systems formed, but it's kind of difficult to come up with a clean interpretation of those observations because they're so heavily distorted by these tidal and magnetic interactions, which aren't very well characterized. So in the Sol survey, we're turning to longer period planets, and the goal there is to provide a cleaner view of hot and warm Jupiter formation with fewer degeneracies because these much wider orbit planets are not going to be nearly as strongly affected by their host stars. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, most obliquity constraints to date have been made for very hot Jupiter systems, very tight orbits. Here we're saying roughly less than five day orbits is what we're calling kind of this main population that has been studied quite well. Um, and what we're focusing on is the longer period planets. Since longer period planets orbit further from their star, they have again, weaker tidal and magnetic effects. And that means that there are just fewer confounding factors when you're trying to interpret the obliquities of these systems. And there's only a handful of planets with orbits beyond about five days um, with obliquity constraints on the host stars. But so far, actually the long period planet population looks really different from the short period counterparts, which is pretty interesting. And that's something that we want to probe further. So in fact, the longest period planets around hot stars have all been relatively close to alignment. So that's this kind of purple region in the middle panel here. And that's not necessarily true for long period planets around cool stars. So, uh, so far these populations suggest that to nearly three sigma, the hot stars are more aligned at longer orbital periods than at shorter orbital periods. And it actually looks like the hotter stars at longer orbital periods are more aligned than the cool stars at equivalent orbital periods. Um, so this is sort of the opposite trend of what we're seeing for very short period planets. Um, so that's kind of something that's not really necessarily expected. There have been some proposed mechanisms that might explain this. So there's a secular resonance that only affects cool stars and would only misalign systems around cool stars that was explored by Anderson and Lai 2018. Uh, but there haven't been a lot of planets that have been observed in this region of parameter space, mostly because um, the longer period planets are, they don't transit as often, and it's a little bit trickier to schedule those observations. Uh, but they're a really interesting population, and I think there's a lot that we can learn from them. So that's what our survey is um, working towards, adding, just adding more of those systems. Um, and so something else to note also is that several of these high obliquity cool star systems host very eccentric planets, which might partially account for this discrepancy when where we're seeing that the cooler star systems tend to be more misaligned. Um, so something that we noticed is that for planets that don't have an eccentricity of exactly zero, higher eccentricity planets tend to show a wider spread in obliquities. So that suggests that these systems might be undergoing something like high eccentricity migration or some other dynamical mechanism that pumps up the obliquity and the eccentricity together. Um, but, oh, well, I'll go straight to the first result. Um, but um, there are few obliquity measurements that have been made for these longer period exoplanet systems. So we're trying to get more of these measurements to robustly constrain this true distribution and to disentangle what kinds of mechanisms will be taking place for hot versus warm Jupiters. So the first measurement that we have made, and this is the first result that has now been 
it's actually now in press, but it's also in archive if you're interested in looking, um, is for K2140b, which is an aligned system. It's a Jupiter-sized planet that has a measured obliquity of about 1.3 degrees, uh, but it's perfectly consistent with exactly a zero degree obliquity. Um, this measurement was made with Keck Hyris, so you can see the kind of symmetric Rosser McLaughlin profile on the right. And we also jointly modeled this with K2 photometry and radial velocities from three different spectrographs. Um, and this particular system has such a long tidal realignment time scale that if it was initially misaligned, then it wouldn't have had time to become realigned. So what that means is that this system probably needed to form quiescently. Um, the planet probably formed in an aligned disk and it remained aligned to the present day. And because planets like K2140b cannot have been realigned by tides or magnetic fields, if we continue to find aligned long period planet systems like this, that can help to inform the maximum rate at which protoplanetary disks themselves are misaligned. And that will help us to distinguish, do these planets tend to become misaligned because their disks are misaligned or because they're interacting with each other in some way that creates these alignments later on in the system's evolution. Uh, we also recently made the second measurement in our survey, and since this isn't yet published, I'll refer to it as SOLS2. Um, we did this using both Keck Hyres and the new spectrograph on the WIND telescope. And I think this is actually the first Rossiter McLaughlin measurement with NUID, and it might actually be the first big science result with NUID. So that's pretty exciting. Um, keep an eye out for this upcoming result. And fitting each of these data sets separately and then jointly, we find the system is pretty close to alignment. So it's not perfectly aligned, but it's quite close to it. There's at least one nearby companion in the system. So since it shows transit timing variations, um, the transits are at slightly different times each time you measure them, we also got joint photometry to better constrain our roster McLaughlin models. Um, and looking jointly at all of the multi-planet systems with reliable obliquity measurements, we see that almost all of them tend to be aligned. So if misalignments are typically induced by dynamically hot mechanisms like planet-planet scattering or high eccentricity migration, we wouldn't necessarily expect companion planets to remain in the system. Um, so as a whole, it looks like these short period multi-planet systems are generally consistent with quiescent formation mechanisms. So probably in situ formation or smooth disk migration where they all, all the planets in the system just sort of remained uh, at the equator um, within kind of the more simple view of um, planet formation. And there are a couple of examples where we don't see the same alignment for multi-planet systems, but generally for each of these systems, there's some sort of interesting exception for why we might expect that it wouldn't be aligned. Like for example, having a stellar companion or something else that could cause that large misalignment. So just to summarize, the SOLS survey is leveraging the Kakairis instrument to work towards increasing our sample of long period exoplanet systems with measured obliquities. Um, and our main goals are to unveil the origins of large misalignments in hot Jupiter systems, to distinguish the, what is causing hot Jupiters versus warm Jupiters, and if those mechanisms have to be different or if they can just be the same mechanism, creating lots of different types of giant planets relatively close into the star. Um, and we also want to figure out the relationship between obliquity, eccentricity, and multiplicity in planetary systems, um, which really hasn't been very well constrained because of this sort of complication with the tides and the shorter period systems. Um, so we have ongoing observations at a rate of a few systems per semester. Um, so we'll actually be back on sky at the start of next week. So fingers crossed for great weather on Mauna Kea. Uh, and keep an eye out for upcoming publications from our observations. Um, so I'll take any questions and thank you. Great, thanks Manina. Uh, questions? From Chaz uh, online. So Chaz, can you speak? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so great talk, really interesting. Um, how do you see the evolution of this program once we get the uh, KPF capabilities? I mean, it doesn't speed up the observation. You have to look at a whole transit, but with the extra precision that you would get from KPF, you know, where would you want to go? You know, smaller planets in closer, um, what's the direction that you'd want to go to? Fainter planets, you know, fainter stars, 
Yeah, so the, the Rossiter McLaughlin measurements are limited by the signal to noise that you can get across a single transit. So I think what we would be able to do with KPF then is mostly push to smaller planets because we just have better precision across that single transit, but we're not able to increase the number of photons because the telescope right. is still the same size. Um, yeah, but I, I believe that that's what KPF will allow us to do, but I would need to look and into so, it more to be certain. So is there a science case for doing that or we've learned everything with the big planets and the smaller planets? You know, do you see a break somewhere in the properties? Yeah, so there have been attempts to understand the obliquities of smaller planets, but they're generally at the population level. Um, so usually for any sort of survey that's looking at smaller planets, you'd be looking at B sine I of the stars. And so because all of these transiting planet systems are measured with a very specific geometry, um, if you look at B sine I, you should have systematically larger measured B sine I if you have I think if you have aligned systems, I might be getting that backwards. Um, but you can look at the spin of the system at a population level for the systems with transiting small planets to try to understand what their obliquities are. But we don't actually have, as far as I know, any really compelling direct measurements, or, except in very exceptional cases where I know there have been measurements for, for example, the Trappist uh, planets, right. but it's pretty uncommon to get these smaller planet obliquity measurements directly. And it I think it would be quite interesting to see if there's a reason to believe that the small planet systems also form in these really dynamically hot ways because hot Jupiter formation, high eccentricity migration is like this big, interesting idea for how you might get these really, really close in giant planets. Um, but we don't have as much of a sense of how common that kind of mechanism is for the smaller planets. Great, thank you. All right, I uh, don't think we have time for another question, but uh, let's thank the speaker again. Mm -hmm.